so welcome everyone and I'm Helen from Farming Secrets. I'm Raymond Miladoni from Farming Secrets. And I'm Hugo Disler from Farming Secrets. We're here to talk about regenerative farming but really what you are doing matters so it's what we really want everyone to go away with knowing that one little weenie thing of what you're doing matters. So can I start with a story? It's about a young man and he grew up on a little farm, a, like a permaculture farm really. Uh, his parents came, they planted an orchard, veggie garden, had chooks and sold the eggs and the poultry and um, sheep. And he started, he grew up with farming. And when, when he finished school, what he did was contract, bought a truck with his mate and they went contracting around the area. This is in the Yarra Valley and started uh, contracting, cutting hay and things like that. And then someone, another farmer would say, oh, have you got any oats and stuff? So they ended up, the two of them, renting a shed and buying things from the people they were contracting to and selling and buying that way. So that was how this enormous farm produce store, farm supply store built up from one person being passionate about looking after his community. And so he, um, he wanted to help everyone. And so if someone said, have you got uh, like oats or have you got chaff or have you got uh, went into Blumstone boots, have you got a Kubra hat? He kept supplying his community and it was basically dairy, horses and orchards, berries, it still is, um, stone fruits, things like that. So he had quite a wide range of clients and this place grew very big. Then this young man met a young lady and she went to look at his store and literally saw a drum that had a skull on it and crossbones and said poison. And she said, what's that for? Because he, she knew he was supplying farmers. And he said, oh, the, the orchardists use that. And she said, but then people like us eat those, that produce. Yeah, well, that's what they want, he said. But that was when he started realising he wasn't actually supporting his clientele when the orchardist, one of the orchardists actually died at 55 of an illness, assume, assuming it is from the poisons he was using and spraying. And his son came and said, you know what, you could be selling basalt dust. So he went out and looked for basalt dust, rock dust. Then he thought, well, I wonder what else is out there, because he was selling all the pivot things. He was like a big elders, really, and started looking for alternative products. Now, this is back in oh, late 70s, 80s. He was concerned about what farmers were using and their health, because he was seeing the health was being affected. So he got Australian mineral fertilizers to supply him. Then he heard about fish and kelp products. Then he heard about Pat Colby, who talks about minerals for animals. So he got separate minerals in and employed a naturopath, which was pretty unheard of in those days, to help people with their animals to have natural health. And, and, and Pat ended up putting this store in his her book because so few people were providing these products. The staff weren't too happy and because he also put all the pivot things, it was a drive-through produce store, he put all the products that were popular with people downstairs. They had to actually lump them up and put them in the boot and all the products he wanted to sell that were natural, he put along the driveway and then human nature being what it was, the staff would say, oh, would you like this one instead of your pivot one, two, five, whatever it was, five, two, one. So slowly he got the people coming in to change. So then he decided this wasn't really good enough and sold that business because it was really hard to get people to understand why they should change to more natural products. And he bought a, a company called Vitec that made and sold and manufactured stock supplements and fertilizers. And thought, well, that'll, that'll be great. I'll be supplying the things I want to do and started going to field days like this thousands of them. The farmers came, fish, seaweed, you know, 
Uh, but then there were ones that were coming and saying, yes, I'm using that, and this is what's happened. And he started hearing of these wonderful stories of change. And um, so that was great. And then he um, thought, no, I'm still not, still not getting out there. And so that young man started with his young girl, Farming Secrets. So that's the story of us and how we got to be where we are, talking to people because we have been going, well, for, <laughs> it's about 13 years with Farming Secrets, talking to thousands and thousands of par farmers and just trying to get people to understand um, another way or giving it another go. And I have to say that a lot of women, and because we're the nurturers, uh, where it starts quite often on farms and um, someone would ring in and say, but my husband won't try your fish fertilizer and things like that. And I, I would literally say, well, look, just buy a litre, 20 litres, run along the driveway and see if there's any difference. And then you can say, see, and it worked. You know, just, just giving it a go. So that's us. And now I'm going to talk, hand you over to this young man. <laughs> <laughs> but our, when I first met him, our dating was going and buying hay and we had to look inside the hay to make sure it wasn't mouldy and everything else because he wanted to always provide the best for people. So that's where he came from, is really making sure that farmers were cared for and looked after and supported because what we saw was the big companies, I'm sorry, it's money first quite often and I don't want to upset anyone here but follow the money and quite often it's not actually putting money back in your pocket it's more money you're putting out so without further ado i'll hand you over to hugo i'll give you a brief rundown of where, why we are where we are now and um, the two major points are the world's got to change and it's going to change when more than 15 percent of people uh, get away from certain Things like greed, greed, and whatever else. Come out to the tent, and I'll give you the list of what what um, Dr. David Hawkins had to say about that. When there's more people in the world who uh, calibrate over 200, Gandhi calibrated 720. The, the so-called statesmen who start wars calibrated 60. So when more the people, when more than 15% of people, according to Dr. David Hawkins, calibrate over 200 then the world can change because the, the 15, 20 percent of the people will drag the 80 percent across to a better way of living. So that's where we want people to get and to the, the best people to get to that point is communities and predominantly in those communities we want farmers producing or food producers producing high quality toxin free food and fibre that keeps people healthy. So that's what we're on about. My friends now are travelling around the world. And around 1970, we, I thought we'd be pretty good. We got into this group. We called ourselves the Easter group because every Easter we used to get together. And there was about eight agricultural scientists there. And I was this farm supply guy. I thought I was going to learn quite a few things from these guys. But what happened was when I read in the Weekly Times, that's our local paper here, about the Sir Ian Potter's foundation growing trees. And they grew grew trees around 1970, they must have grown earlier than that because I read this thing in 1970 or 71. Give it a few years, doesn't matter. And uh, what they said that they did test that if farmers grew 10 or 15% of their trees in boundaries, around boundaries or creeks, etc., that they'll actually improve their profitability on the farm just through the climate, climatic change. And I'll get back to your question too, sir because I've done research on that and it, the more trees you plant the better. So when I said that to these uh, agricultural scientists, two of them actually swore at me. So they said, no, you got things wrong. Use bad words. And uh, it, it took me back because I thought, here you blokes uh, know what you're talking about. Here I am reading this uh, thing from Sir Ian Potter's uh, foundation. What's going on here? And being a slow learner, I didn't take too much notice of that, but as time went on, more and more things sort of became land uh, points of change. And um, like in a store, 
we have the pivot list of what what p people should use and on the pivot uh, list we had things like onions etc and have onions in heavy soil or onions in uh, sandy soil and here's the two products you'd sell them and this is the rate you'd sell them at so that's how we used to talk to our farmers then i got smart that oh no we've got to look at trace minerals so looked at trace minerals and uh, asked we never want to do work with farmers, this one is starting to sell natural fertilizers, unless they did a proper soil test with all the trace minerals. But what we're finding now is that there's layers and layers and layers and there's a whole lot of myths. And I'll jump to the end result, which I want all you folk to understand. We all know where Fraser Island is, don't we? Fraser Island up in Queensland. Fraser Island consists of nothing but silica dioxide sand, probably the worst sand in, in the world and yet it grows rain, a rainforest. How does that rainforest get there? It, and that is the key. That's where farmers got to get to, is how to grow high quality food and produce under adverse conditions, and you, and you do that by plant diversity. We'll get back onto trees, right? Shane Joyce, who ran a, a very big farm, I think it was 7,000 hectares at Theodore in Queensland in the Brigalow country. And this is a jump thing. When the Brigalow country was a fairly high rainfall area, reliable rainfall, cleared the, um, cleared the Brigalow or the bush, whatever it was, and um, the, the things changed. Not only things changed, it became a drought area, it became an arid area. Shane Joyce has got a property there which he re recently sold. But what he found was uh, that um, where he left the trees, sparse trees on his property, he's about 7,000 hectares, that um, the productivity was much higher where the trees were, had cattle. And his, what he made was very clear that the return on, on the land was higher where the trees were and the sparse trees. And what he made it very clear, it's not the trees that uh, are the problem, it's the way things are grazed that is the problem. Because when you graze in a, such an appropriate way, which, which I'll talk about next, that you've got the recovery, then the grass will grow right up against the trees, the animals get there, there's a better temperature, which again gets there, there's four degrees better temperature, uh, and the, the grass responds earlier, the grass stays green longer, everything works better under the trees. So we've been told this myth that, you know, trees and plants don't go together. So um, I'll go to the next point. So the whole idea is to get as many, we'll get to the next point, uh, variety, uh, diversity. You want as much diversity on your property as you possibly can including weeds and you sort of think uh, 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 I don't want thistles actually thistles are probably one of the most mineral rich plants you can get and if anyone's ever chopped up a, pulled out a blackberry out of the thing just have a look at the soil under a blackberry it's the most perfect soil you could get in your garden under the blackberry why because it brought up the minerals it's got the, the cosmic energy coming down through and into the thing so let me explain very briefly how plants work. Plants, have, as Dr. Phil Callahan said, he was a, well, World War II, uh, I'll say scientist, radio technician, extraordinary. And um, he worked out that uh, his definition of plants and antenna to the cosmos, not so my definition, it's his. And that a plant is an actually an antenna to the cosmos, so it's getting cosmic energy, we'll say sunlight for ease of understanding, and it's conducting that sunlight, and a, a plant is a, a nothing but a mass of chemicals. It has a lot of different chemicals. And because the plant wants a different sort of chemicals, say, say we're talking about um, uh, Patterson's Curse, uh, we'll just explain how Patterson's Curse works. It takes the solar energy and it exudes out of its hair roots an exudate, and that exudate, it's a liquid, or it's simple sugars, whatever you might call it, and it's a message to the, the soil fungi and the bacteria. And notice I said fungi, take your word, because what we're doing with a lot of agricultural practices, we're destroying the fungi, and the fungi is the connector, and it can go for, and the fungi hyphen can go for kilometres attached to a hair root. And as a result, plants can be uh, drought proof, 
plants will respond better when the new season comes. Plants will actually respond when there's a dews. So that then the plant, the comparison curse says, I want this to the fungi, and the fungi feeds it copper or whatever else it wants, whatever the plant is rich wants. Take a thistle, for instance. It, it's such a complex factory that it's sending out such complex uh, messages. It's getting such complex uh, nutrients back. And it's, when the, a picture showed of a thistle, the thistle root could be four, four foot deep, 1.2 metres deep. And it's pulling up nutrients from deep down and uh, bringing them to the top. So what, I'll give you another example on, on thistles. I know I'm jumping from one thing to another, but this farmer at um, Kingston, South Australia, he had a problem with uh, thistles, and the thistles were getting in the wool, getting in the sheep's eyes, etc. and he didn't know what to do. So the two things he did, he sprayed them with uh, a fish fertiliser, then that was the days when we sold fish fertiliser, and he slashed them at round about flowering time, Peter, Peter uh, Andrews will tell you more about that. And within two years, that, that was his worst paddock, that became equivalent to his best paddock on the farm and stayed that right to today. So that just goes to how thistles, the minerals in the thistles can actually be your friend rather than be this absolute enemy where uh, people have, even on horseback have a really long hoe and chip them out. Well. Being a hay contractor in my early days, you didn't like thistles in your hay, I can assure you. What we're trying to say here, uh, like you can do a resources consulting services course, and that takes five days, and I don't know how many dollars, thousands of dollars it cost you, but it's well worth doing. It's probably the bit, it's regarded as, regarded as the best talk. So what I'm giving you now is, I can't do, like I went to get in a five day course. So hopefully I'm giving you things that uh, are anchoring points. And the next point that I want to come across is diversity. Diversity of plants above ground, diversity of uh, soil life in the ground, and uh, I guess a bit of diversity in our thinking too, so that we uh, don't get caught up with uh, myths that are propagated by uh, big business. Um, so um, what farmers, have, what people have found uh, about diversity and the, probably the be best two diversities that we'll talk about now is the American prairies and, our, and our Australian native grasses. When you look at the Australian native grasses, their communication to the cosmos and the soil is so outstanding. So when you talk, when Peter talks about it, they're probably one of the most amazing grasses in the world. And we've in this recently um, at Dubbo, not uh, this farmer who's farming with naturally, naturally in his, uh, you can look him up, Gilgai Farms, Gilgai Farms. They sell meat directly to the people. I don't know if they sell it to in Victoria. When the university students went to ha on his property, they counted 124 different uh, native grasses on his property. And now he runs his farm so well that he's, uh, and he runs his farm on um, cell grazing or call it whatever you like. You can work the grass in such a way that the grass becomes a fertilizer and you don't have to use any, any fertilizer whatsoever on your property. And it's all to do with diversity and it gets back to the American prairies, Australian grasses, uh, with Australian native grasses. Because Australian native grasses, when farmers have got them going like this particular fellow, Dubbo and other people as well, have got it. And if you want to sort of check on that, uh, you want to get take note, note of the stiper.com, which is a very good group, .com.au, well worth joining. And uh, they do a lot of work in native grasses. Having the diversity of uh, plants, whether it's uh, in your pasture or when you are uh, growing a crop in your cover crop. What's, who's heard of cover crops here? Anyone? Oh, fantastic. Good. Well, what they originally found uh, when the cover crops, they grow about four different, you know, a legume and a tall grass and something else. And now they're saying that you should grow a cover crop with 17 different crops in it. At least 17. And Gay Brown, that's uh, this fellow, 
this fellow's book here. It's called Dirt to Soil, Well Worth Getting. Anyone bought this book yet? Have, have you read it? What do you think? Fantastic. Did you hear what you said? <laughs> Tell me what you heard. <laughs> Must read. Very easy read. Very easy read. I have meters and meters of books at home. A friend of mine has probably a few more meters than I have of books on his bookshelf. He reckons the best book is his, he reckons it's the best book for the farmers. Well, what he found was that he would plant 75, up to 75 different uh, plants, see how they work all together. And what he's also found that he doesn't use any fertiliser. Very, very occasionally he will use a, a chemical, but he thinks that when he's written the book, that soon I won't be using any chemicals at all on my property. He's got 5,000 acres, sells everything directly to people. Dream, isn't it? It's a reality. And that's where we want farmers to get to that point. And, yeah. See this little thing? It's about that, it's about that big, that high, square. Notice it's slatted. And what you do, you raise it a little bit so you can get underneath it. It's called a never filled bin. And you can put some worms in it, but what you might find, like I found, that the compost worm just came from nowhere. My compost bin was uh, 50 feet away, uh, 60 feet away, unless I went from there to there, but they just came there. So the might say, same thing might happen to you. I thought, oh no, that's, that bin will get filled. So I bunked it full, really bunked it full, it went down, bunked it full, haven't filled it yet. And we've got four acres. Oh, this is around the house, right? That will make any amount of compost and it makes the highest quality compost. And I put thistles in that compost and I'll even put blackberries in that compost because I want minerals in the compost. I'll even put a bit of seaweed in the compost and any dishwashing stuff without the detergents. Well, like I'll, I'm the sort of guy who'll rinse the plates into a bucket and I'll, then I'll put that into the compost to activate the compost. Now, I'll go into the next thing. This is, you all, all, people, all you people could do this, whether you're home gardener, or whether you're a big time farmer. See this little contraption? Don't try and work out what it is, I'll tell you. This is a fish tank air bubbler. And this one's got two hoses. You only need to buy one with one hose on it. That will do a 200 litre drum of vermicompost tea. I'll repeat the word, vermicompost tea. Compost tea, vermicompost, worms in front of it. Vermicompost tea, okay. That'll do 200 litres. Very liberally, 20 litres to the hectare. He's got uh, 10 hectares there. But if you want to put 10 litres to the hectare, he's got 20 litres, 20 hectares. I made up the road there, David Bed Bedwell. John Bedwell puts 2,000 litre cubes with um, an air pump with a manifold going to the 2,000 litre cubes and he's got uh, oh, 1,000 acres or something like that, one and a half thousand acres and he'll spread that stuff out, over, try to spread it out over the whole farm uh, with this vermicompost tea and what it, how he's changed that farm is just remarkable for the two years, few years he was running that farm. The um, bin's off the ground and that's where the, you just take the vermicast out. You put food on the top so all the worms go to the top while you're getting your vermicast out. Take the vermicast, so it's a really scraping it out from underneath. Um, I think I didn't mention, we do get rats going to our bins, so <laughs> we've had, um, had problems with that. You've got to put wire or something inside, but it is so, so simple. And he, he also sells vermicasts, he sells the worms. He's down at, near Cressy. Um, he's not posting them anymore, he's had a few parcels sort of, and he's gone into really big scale industrial um, recycling of waste now, uh, which he also is looking for people who want to experiment with things like that as well. He's a real innovator too. And that's really the joy of what we find is we find all these people doing cool little things <laughs> like Devo. It's great. So getting back to this for home gardener, what you want is a bucket of some sort, 20 litres. Well, we have 20, I have 20 litres at home 
and I do about three of these a year and um, then I get some from the neighbours, so I do about half a dozen a year and I'm very liberal with it, uh, with using this stuff, you can use it neat um, or whatever you like. So in a 20 litre bucket you have one of these uh, uh, little pumps, costs $25 and you put in a, a decent handful of vermicompost in it, a little bit of activator like fish fertiliser and if you want to you can put in uh, a bit of sugar or something like that, it doesn't matter a great deal. But we've got a recipe there, we'll uh, send, come to our tent, we'll give you, the, we'll email you the recipe you, and if you, what also David will put in, he'll put in some basalt dust uh, just swirl it around and just make a milky, make a milky. So when he sprays it out, he'll have some basalt uh, going out in with the uh, vermi compost. So um, when, if you've got a lot of plant diversity, including weeds in your in your veggie garden, plus you're doing this, this costs pocket money, less than pocket money, to do to make up a 20 litre container, which is enough to do a hectare. Or, Interesting? Worth it? Good question. Depends how patient you are. Uh, and if you haven't got a microscope, you would do in warm weather, 16 hours, 24 hours, you know, morning to morning, or whatever. Yeah, the, you're trying to breed up, you're trying to expand the bacteria, the, especially the bacteria, there's not much fungi, yeah, you won't get much fungi growth in that time, so you're trying to get the bacteria going, uh, you're multiplying all the goodies that in the vermi compost, that's a better way of saying it, so they, you've got a lot more goodies in the water. And uh, those goodies, uh, they become the food source for more good things, including fungi. Yeah. So they start a change. Wild, wild. It's like you're doing a brewing and stuff. It is a brewing, yeah. 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 I suppose you can you know, experiment and do anything you like. All you need is a, a 25 litre single hose. You don't need two hoses for a 20 litre container, 200 litre container. And the other thing that he does, he puts silica in now too, you know, that's uh, something, yeah, clay, a bit of clay. And natural microbes, he'll go under a tree and just grab a handful of natural microbes. So you're getting your native microbes multiplying. And um, it, look, it just keeps more and more coming on. So you can see we just, there's just so much. But if, you, if at least you go away to see that there's easy things to do and worm composting is so safe, kids can play on it. Like, you can put a few hay bales around and put your rubbish in there and put the worms in and the kids can play on it. It's so so clean. Where you know, which is fantastic. You can do your thermal composting, but I think we've got to wrap up. Thermal composting is very good. It can be very scientific. It can get rid of like fungi on uh on grapevines because uh, you're designing a particular compost uh, and it, you're brewing it up in a particular way. But let the worms do the job for you, let nature do the job for you. The only compost tea for the home gardener and for the commercial grower, it's magic. So I guess I'll just quickly um, share about myself a little bit. So a lot of people here might be here. So again, my name is Ray Miladoni for the people who came a bit later. Um, I've recently just started working with Farming Secrets on a bit more of a formal arrangement um, to take the business to the next level. We originally uh, post around a lot of DVDs as this one here is compost, just do it. So this is kind of the information that we were filming from all around Australia and sending out to farmers via a on-demand kind of service or a membership uh, kind of service um, with physical DVDs. And the last few years, I've taken a big interest into questioning where my food comes from, the quality of the food I'm eating, um, played around with a few different diets and so forth. But a lot of people here will be familiar with retro suburbia and as a bit of a new concept. But this, was my, this is my grandfather's backyard, what it was 34 years ago and what it is still today. It hasn't changed. Uh, we got to play cricket on concrete and if the ball went into the garden you'd lost it. It was an instant out, game over and you chased around the garden with a wooden spoon. So I grew up with Retro Suburbia, I thought that's what everyone's back garden looked like. So everything that we grew was always from the garden, we had chickens roaming the field, 
Um, but as you can see, even my grandparents, with a lot of their knowledge, they still have bare soil. They don't really understand cover cropping or my grandfather feels like it's productive to go out and just turn the soil for the fun of it because it gives him something to do and maybe some space for my grandmother who's out there telling him that he's doing it wrong. <laughs> um, it's a bit hard to see, but in this photo in the back, they're just starting to put um, sugarcane um, mulch on top of their their soil just to protect it and keep the temperature higher and that's coming from a little bit of the knowledge that I'm sharing to my dad and then he's sharing to his dad, my grandfather. So that's the back backyard that I grew up in. Um, I also acquired 40 acres in Wood End Tilden area um, which is very cold um, but we took a bit more of a no chemical approach. This was before meeting Farming Secrets and so this is me on a ride on lawnmower um, dealing with some thistles doing a bit of chop and drop before it goes to seed. Um, we were also hand picking it manually out every weekend in the cold or rain uh, with a pick or even sometimes we'd get the hand lawnmower out and just doing whatever we could to stop it from going from seed. Um, we've now kind of realised that there's some really good nutrition in the seeds and you can do other things with it but I didn't have the time to go out and pick or chop all the heads off and put them into a separate bag and do something else with it but that's just to prove that if you've learned some knowledge um, there's a lot of derivatives that can come from something such as a weed um, and so this is just me learning off YouTube I would like just in time learning I'd head out in the paddock I still had 4G and I'd watch a video of like what to do with thistles and then I would go and start the law on my own and go and do it so I wasn't investing in a lot of information forward thinking I was just kind of hacking it together um, as things came along and the reason why I share that is because there may be a lot of people in the crowd going you know I'm new to this I don't know what to do it seems like this knowledge is really extreme and that's kind of I'm still learning too and I think the best mindset that you can have is to always be in a room where you're the not so smart person and learn from others who have done that before you and so I was working at a company that was an education company and farming secrets happened to buy one of the online courses and so when we kind of realized that we had farming in common the owner of the business joined us together we met at the Christmas party and just didn't stop talking about just everything that we thought was kind of weird and you know nerdy and geeky and, and and we just kind of vibed and so I started volunteering some of my time and I became an affiliate of their company to promote the information they had because the more they spoke I just thought wow you have DVDs do people still have DVD players and there's so much wealth of knowledge um, in these DVDs and they've actually gone onto farms and interviewed farmers and I thought well you're the glue like I don't have time to go and visit all these farmers and ask them questions and they've gone out there and done that for me and I get to just now watch a DVD and learn from others who have been there done that and talking from experience rather than just knowledge and textbooks and so I was always super impressed with how much information uh, they had and um, we, we spent some time at Farming Secrets HQ which is out in the Dandenong Ranges and every time I left there I was just like wow there is so much knowledge sitting on these shelves we need to get it out there and so I volunteered as an affiliate and was promoting their business for a small commission um, and that's kind of how the relationship started and then it went into a bit more of a formal arrangement where I was working two days a week and it was all about just getting the information out there. How could we digitalize some of these DVDs and distribute them in any way that we could? If you wanted transcriptions, we'd get transcriptions. If you wanted MP3, we'll get you MP3. If you wanted to listen to it in the tractor while you were tilling the soil, learning why you shouldn't till the soil. Um, like whatever you, we could do to get this information into people's hands, we were just doing it. Um, and so we now have a huge library of just information digital or DVD and if you visit our stand small gold coin donation and your name which you probably already put on the on the information sheet there's some DVDs that you can take away with you and a lot of the principles may be at farming level but you can apply them at home level as well because it's all about soil and soil health and just understanding the nutrition that comes through that plant and into our mouths um, and that closed loop system of just not having any waste and being able to reuse everything from that and every time I spoke to Farming Secrets they would tell me something new that they had a club website and they had a membership model and they had like an ask an experts system and I was like so people can join and ask an expert and I just see it every day now where someone will come in with a problem or a question and Helen will be like you need to speak to this person and I often refer to her as the librarian 
of farming secrets, which she was actually a librarian. I didn't know that. I was like, you're like the librarian. You go in and you say, I need help with this. And they go, I will four book four four six one eight, and that's kind of what we're like of farming secrets. We may not have all the answers here today, and there's lots of people with different questions and your farm is uniquely your farm and it may have different signals and solutions that need to be applied and that's what I really enjoyed working with Farming Secrets is no it doesn't matter what email comes in or what problem you have they know the recipe to give you the solution and it might be you know chapter two of this DVD and then watch all of this and then read this book and that's your unique recipe and solution so it's not a one size fits all model and that really aligned with me and the way that I enjoy learning and the reason why now we're you know talking about how I can take the business to the next generation and keep the Farming Secrets brand um, going and so I just want to mention two things we've got a guide that um, Helen's put together which is the um, seven steps to healthy soil and so if you've popped your details on that sheet that's going around and if you haven't you can now just find where it is or come and see us at our stand but we'll email all this out to you um, it all, you know, for our belief is that if you've got healthy soil, you've got healthy food, and it's a great closed loop system. And so, over the years and years of interviewing farmers, Helen and Hugo found that there were these common traits and these things that you needed to do to see whether you had healthy soil. And if you didn't, from an observation walk, you could then find ways of re repairing that. Um, and so, we've got a guide and do it yourself kind of soil kits. And obviously, if you've got more of a commercial farmer, you, you've got ways of taking that soil to labs and getting readings and how to interpret those readings and what some extra tests you may want to ask for to get better understanding of your soil as well, rather than the one size fits all. Because sometimes even the labs don't really understand this extended version of soil health and what we're actually looking for and the biology of, of soil. Um, so sometimes there's some extra tests that you may want to ask for as well. And then from in meeting all the farmers, they discovered the 10 must-dos that you needed to have. And so they put a guide together. You've popped your details in, you'll get an email in the next couple of days with links to all these resources. Because there's just so much information out there and it can be a little bit confusing. And we know it's confusing. And even when we chat in the office, uh, we bounce from one thing to another because we're just trying to do too many too many things and that's just because we really want to help as many people um, and that's why we, we're here today is just to share that message and just to remind everyone that it doesn't matter what you're doing if it's just buying something organic or if it's questioning should I be putting this chemical on my land just that one action of questioning it you're already in the right step in the right direction um, and just questioning, you know, who you're asking the information from. Do They may not know any better and it's not anyone's kind of fault, but it's just you go somewhere and ask for information. And that's what I love about the story is Hugo was someone who was recommending these products because he was product knowledge. And that's just what you did. You had this problem and you put this product. Yeah, and glyphosate came out while we still had green fields of Lilydale and it came in this great pack and we were told it was non-residual, got rid of all your weeds. So we actually had it on the counter and we're saying, hey, have you seen this fantastic new product that doesn't damage the soil but gets rid of all your weeds? We didn't know any better. And you know, it's horrific when you think how many of these things we've sold, but we're still meeting, far one, I'd say, a lot of farmers who feel they have to use glyphosate and we appreciate what, where they're coming from but we're very happy to discuss. Maybe you could just try, well, we have people putting fish and kelp in with it and breaking it down and feeding the soil while you're poisoning those weeds. So there's little things you can do to just alleviate the damage. And of course, you can't publicize that because we could get sued by you know, the company for, and the farmer can then say, well, you haven't used your product properly. And so you're not insured, all sorts of stuff. But yeah, we've found little ways all the time. and. We're not here to do anything but find solutions and remind you that what you're doing does matter. Um, Hugo said before as well that you can do anything. Like if you want to experiment with adding something into the compost tea, do a test, do one side of your driveway without it and the other with it and then add to that learning and then write back to us and say, we did the compost tea and I put 
this mineral on the left side and this mineral on the right side and this is what happened and together we get to learn more um, and that's you know even we haven't even started the event just from last night setting up I think we've got like an extra three or four people that we want to go and visit their farms and record what they're doing um, and, and it's just that continual learning um, so the more that everyone's sharing about what they're doing and how they're planting trees and um, breaking the system I know Hugo didn't maybe finish the story but traditionally everyone plants trees in rows and now there's lots of research to show that the more random the trees are grown is creating good biodiversity and the stand next to us, Land Care, is showing people how to make seed bombs and just letting nature grow trees exactly where nature wants it to be and where the minerals are right for that seed. And so there's that randomness and that level of just letting nature be nature in its natural course. The other great thing that I love, and even just last night we had dinner with Peter Andrews and that was kind of on the cuff organised. There's years and years of relationships that Helen and Hugo have built up. So there's not many people, scientists, doctors, farmers, that they don't know that they could put you into contact with. If there's any questions that you have, we may not have the answers, but we may be the glue to the person or people or group that we can introduce you to. So come and have a chat to us at the stand, get around um, our newsletters or our information, our video and content, um, and get, be able to get access to these experts. So there is a story, and I know, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name before um, with the farm, yep, yourself. Megan, Megan, this is that photo that I was telling you about where there was two transparencies with neighbors farms just you know, on, on a fence line. So that was that uh, story we spoke about. But Helen's gonna share that story a little bit in more detail now, because the reason why this story is great is because it's very local to this area. Um, and so we thought we'd showcase this and maybe people may know them or maybe people who we're talking about might be in the audience. So if you are, pop your hand up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we came down here with <coughs> Elaine Ingham and I've got to see you here, Gillian. <laughs> we had a, a big talk um, at Camperdown Football Club, Club or something talking about compost. And that, that DVD, Compost Just Do It, came from it. But the introduction was based on the farmers we'd taken her to the day before who are dairy farmers. Now, are any of those dairy farmers who were now part of Green Pastures Milk here? Yeah? No? Anyone know the story of the dairy farmers? No? Okay. This photo here uh, is of um, Andrew Whiting's farm. He started, he came here as a dairy farmer and he had really uh, rye grass he was growing and it was like in, just in solid, it looked like someone had actually put it in in divots. It was so loose and everything. He was re every year. And um, there were a few other dairy farmers. We've got, we've got information. We've actually got, oh, I'll tell the story first. Anyway, so Camperdown Compost, Tony Evans, um, who wanted to make compost, had done Elan's courses and things, realised that compost was going to help farmers get away from the areas and things like this. So, and Dairy farmers have effluent, they have their tracks they've got to get rid of, all sorts of um, product, waste products on a dairy farm. So he went in with his compost maker and did it for them. He collected the um, effluent, the waste that was going on, and it cleaned up a pollution problem, but he also started composting it and had rows of rows of the thermal compost in the farm itself. So the farmers didn't have to do anything except ask Tony to come in. And so we went to film a dairy day back uh, earlier, I've forgotten what year it was now, probably 2007 or, uh, I don't know. We went back when Elan came out because we were working with her and we took her down to these farmers and there are the Whitings, the McGlades, Clays and Davis family. We went to it. Does anyone know those farmers? No, you don't, yeah? Okay, so this is Andrew's farm after the compost. And I, I did have a before photo and he goes, well, we don't want to show problems, we want to show the solutions. So I haven't brought the before or after, except on the right, that's his neighbour. So it really is the before there, but although Andrew's looked even worse because he tried to improve and he had these pumps that the cattle just pull out. So. Um, that maybe you'll be pleased to hear is, has a paddock that now looks like Andrew's because he wanted to know, what are you doing? Yeah, which is quite unusual. Our neighbours quite often just ignore someone doing something brilliant and don't even think to ask. 
So the Whitings had that grass being pulled out. They were doing direct drilling. They were using lots and lots of nitrogen fertilisers and were subject to those price hikes. Uh, the fertility wasn't good. The profit margins weren't good. And he was very disillusioned. He was ready to stop farming. He was so disillusioned. And he had animal health problems as well, which he hadn't connected with the soil fertility. The McGlades had high costs of sprays, seed, because they were re-sowing every year, insecticides, herbicides, fertilisers. They knew they weren't doing the right thing, but they didn't know what to do. They had no clover, cockchafers, low bricks, which a bricks meter is something that measures the uh, sugars in your soil. We've got one over if you want to come and have a look at it. A very simple instrument. And <coughs> they were feeding a lot of trace elements to their cows. The clays, their fertiliser costs were totally out of control. They had insect pressure on their lucerne. They had no air flight management plan and insecticides were used regularly and they had no clover. And Davis had red-legged earth mites, loose and flea, attacking the rye grass. They had low bricks, they had shallow roots, uh, no clover either, no mycorrhizal fungi. Hugo was talking about that fungi that can go for kilometres collecting nutrients. They couldn't really see that they had mycorrhizal fungi doing any job at all because of disturbance, all the roots, all the mycorrhizal fungi had just been chopped up and gone. And they had no waste management plan. So da Tony went in with making his compost and putting it up for them. And the results were deeper rooting system. The cows weren't pulling the grass out by the roots. They were re costs were re decreased by 90%. They established pasture ready for autumn break without re -sowing. Tony used a liquid nitrogen still. He, they've all been using urea, but he reduced that nitrogen use down to a minimal, and they're probably not using any now. I don't know, we haven't been back. Um, Fertiliser costs were significantly reduced. Best practice in waste management, no disease or insect pressure. Cow fertility looked to have improved significantly, but he needed to validate it at the point of that filming. The stocking rate had increased over the last two years by 15%, and mycorrhizal fungi was present in test paddocks. That was the whitings. Do you want to hear the results of the others? Yeah. Is that enough to know that you're going to make a difference using compost? Yeah. So what we've done today um, is tell you that story of Hugo. He was passionate to help, help people and did a lot of awful stuff with I can still see that skull and crossbones. I just couldn't believe it. You know, the farmers would pick up a drum with a skull and crossbones and poison written on it. And that was how it was in those days. It was normal, you know, business as usual. Um, and then Hugo's told you uh, a minimal amount of solutions and things that a farmer can do. There's so many different ways. If you just know in your heart you'd like to make some changes, um, We'd love to talk to you to get you to um, choose something. And it might even be cooking from scratch. You know, or maybe growing your own veggies. It might start there or something. I, I, it's, there's so many things you can do, um, starting with your compost. And then Ray has been up here sharing his background. And he does. He, every time he comes to our place, he says, oh, wow. You know, he's just in awe of all the things that basically are like myths and that's why we called it farming secrets because when we started it was unbelievable what people weren't farmers were not being told and farmers were being kept out of the loop of simple simple things you can do like we went to one farm he had his bales of hay this is ron smith who's a dairy farmer and he was pouring molasses along the top of them before he put them out and he, we said, what are you doing? And he said, well, that's going to increase microbial growth overnight. And those bales are going to be double the nutrition when you put them out. Now, how simple is that? Even if you did that, you know, it's, it's just simple little things we keep finding. And I'm, I was a teacher and I'm a librarian, so I just get so excited <laughs> over little things that we can share with people and we do have a blog you can just go to the blog but we'd love you to come up and join our list so i can send you out um information when we put new stuff up oh the milk story yes so those sorry that was a huge result those dairy farmers 
ended up realising the milk that they were producing was so good that they formed their own company called Green Pastures and got Coles to stock it and sell it at their price. They weren't told what price they were to sell, and said, if they won't sell it, we'll just sell it somewhere else. But you can go onto the website. I had a cart on, and I, um, we went to the launch in Federation Square in Melbourne. I mean, that's how big it was, with this, these farmers getting together, kids all running around happy and everything. It's just the most joyous story to see a group of farmers get together, collaborate, and market together, and bring it does bring life back to communities of people uh, working with their communities. Um, so I think that's it, isn't it? That's it. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, when you film me, you get eaten by cows and horses and everything else. That car kept coming up and licking me. <laughs> so we've had a lot of fun and um, we really, really um, acknowledge everyone here for coming to hear a little bit more about how you can regenerate your farm and as we say fall in love with your farm again so thank you very much and please come up and stay around we're here all day um peter andrews has now joined our tent as well so if you want to talk to him we're just around the corner here we'd love to talk to you and if you want more information there is a list going on oh you guys got it so you want to say thank you to him? thank you <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So final words for me was just keep doing what you're doing and um, everything matters. Don't think that what you're doing is just very small because that's where change starts and that's where, you know, the, the, the rhythm and the momentum and the ripple effect happens. So just keep doing what you're doing and um, and, and just, yeah, just follow that and trust your instinct sometimes as well. If what um, Helen said is if you just feel that you want change, you may not be able to rationalise that or put any logic to it. Um, and that was with myself as well. Everyone's just like, poison the thistles, it's easy. It'll be done, you know, tomorrow. Why are you going out there in the rain? Um, but the, the, the inner calling was greater. Thank you for being here. And it's absolutely amazing uh, when, some, when farmers ring up, you have a start, starting a casual conversation. So out of a casual conversation, quite often something very deep and meaningful, useful opens up. So have conversations with fellow people, fellow farmers, get, get the ball rolling. And a final thing is a gift Thank for you. you. Uh, we've got copies, they're not in the covers like this, but this is a copy of the story of those dairy farmers, us visiting them. So if you want a copy, it's free. We just ask for a donation. Um, they're just over there, you can pick one up and um, have a look at that. And there's also Pat Colby and Jerry Brunetti DVDs. So there's also this one, which is Martin Stapp of Biology and Agriculture and I asked for free copies and they said, no, you can't have them. And I said, why can't I have them? And they said, no, no, you've got to put a notice in them. And the notice that we had to put in was, please take note, the New South Wales Department of Industry, is that TPI? Advisors of landholders consult with local extension staff to further discuss and understand this topic, which was looking at the soil, uh, before considering adopting any management recommended in here, right? So I did get some free DVDs, so they're here for you to look at, and it's very, very good looking at how you can understand your soil. <laughs> and the DVD is called Biology in Agriculture. A Guide to Protecting and Enhancing Soil Productivity. So there you go. So thank you. <laughs>